Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, pray silence for our guest speaker, Mr. Andrew Marr. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and, and thank you uh, first to, to the President, Sir Roger, for that very, very kind introduction at the beginning. Basically, the message um, that I've been given for this evening is you've had a series of spectacularly eloquent, well-made and moving speeches. You've had the Prime Minister being gloriously uh, Prime Ministerial. Um, you've had uh, Ed Miliband being uh, surprisingly um, unscripted and, and fluent. And the question there, of course, is, but who is Gromit? Um, you've had, uh, I mean, you've, you, you, you've had Boris being, being very, Boris has a certain amount of problems in the past, a bit of transit problems, all sorts of things going wrong in the past, but uh, if you carry on talking like this, people love you, and uh, it's all going fantastically well. Um, and you've had Vince Cable, um, who is naturally slightly funereal, um, but he's in a, in a um, Anyway, I, 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 I was told um, we've had a series of absolutely superb speeches, and Andrew, uh, tonight from you, uh, at the end of the meal, would like something different. I will endeavour to oblige. Um, uh, wh what I've been asked to talk about um, is just to give a little bit of an overview. Um, I am a very, very lucky bystander um, in my professional life. I have the privilege of uh, watching politics in this country from a, a relatively close uh, perspective, and thanks to various projects around the world, I've spent quite a lot of time recently in Washington, the United States, and in China, and so on. And so I thought what I'd do is talk a little bit about, from um, my utterly inexpert uh, bystander's perspective, um, the way everything seems to be fitting together or not um, just at the moment. So I thought I'd start by talking uh, a little bit about domestic politics, um, where we have um, still uh, more than two years to run of a uh, a rather uneasy and unhappy, um, but nonetheless um, secure coalition, a, a marriage that is holding together despite all the pressures. And um, uh, we have um, in um, the Prime Minister a man, I would say, and I think this is very interesting, whose destiny is still really very much in his own hands. Not entirely, um, but to a very large extent. That is... Uh, what we know, uh, Mervyn King was uh, reminding us just a couple of days ago, uh, we know that we are in a very odd, slow, difficult um, uh, semi-recovery um, or a kind of flat calm for a period in which the old rules of democratic politics, uh, which I was brought up in, uh, namely that politicians must go to the electorate and say, vote for me and life will be better tomorrow. I will give you more stuff. Everything will be easier. Your children will have a better time too. That world is over. Uh, we are now in a very different political world where politicians uh, are going to have to find ways of coming to the electorate and saying, well, honestly, it's tough. It's going to carry on being tough. Um, and uh, we can't give you a lot of hope for a sort of materially richer short-term future, but stick with us and things will get better. And we're only beginning to scratch the surface of the new language um, uh, that is going to be required for that in politics. Now, what we know um, from what we observe in the economy is that uh, the private sector, for all sorts of reasons, has not been able, um, as some ministers optimistically hoped, to simply move in and, and, and take up all the slack. And there is clearly a huge argument, discussion, going on inside government at the moment about a big new drive for growth. Um, this is absolutely fascinating um, because if you are going to be funding a lot of new infrastructure spending, um, if that is the way things are going, and the argument is being uh, conducted very vigorously at the moment by Vince, by George, by all the rest of them, then uh, clearly if it's going to happen, two things need to happen first. One is uh, you need to be able to find uh, the language and the way to position um, this new um, strategy in a way which does not look like a U-turn or an apology for a past failure and so on. And secondly, and, 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 and that is above all, of course, um, to uh, protect the position of the Chancellor, and secondly, um, you have to find ways of funding it. And you know that there's no funding going to be coming, uh, no extra funding going to be coming uh, through the traditional public sector uh, channels, so you have to be able to persuade the banking sector, frankly, um, to help you to find new and innovative ways to raise funding for a major new growth push, which is what 
a lot of people inside the coalition government at the moment are talking about. Um, and I don't know, but I, standing on the outside, I begin to, I, I'm listening to the language, I'm listening to what um, uh, David Cameron is saying and George Osborne is saying and the way they are talking about banking and uh, the new rhetoric about we must, at this point, really stop uh, bashing the bankers. It's time to start supporting the banking sector, standing behind the banking sector here and in Europe. And of course, the banking sector does need political coverage. It does need political support very much at the moment. And so I begin to wonder whether there's the makings of some kind of grand bargain uh, going on between um, the government uh, wanting uh, new investment infrastructure and growth and wanting new agreements um, and a new closeness. And certainly a lot of people in the banking sector are talking uh, to the government um, much more intensely than they've been doing for a while. Um, so that's the first thing that David Cameron is going to have to um, be able to deliver. Um, the next thing I think that he's going to have to be able to do is much, much harder, which is find a way through what is the sort of existential um, problem facing this government. Um, now, you've had a very, very good taster of all of this, I think, today. Um, you've had the Prime Minister focusing, I think, perhaps a surprising amount on Europe in his speech to you, and then you've had Ed Miliband focusing on Europe as well. And certainly, I know all of us uh, in the media um, are, are very crude um, in the way we, we drag a few messages from sophisticated and subtle speeches and put them on headlines. But certainly, we in the media have taken out the, 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 the sort of confrontationally different messages on Europe um, from, from Labour uh, and from the Prime Minister as the story um, of the day so far. Now, who knows what's going to happen um, during this week's incredibly difficult and intense uh, arguments about uh, freezing, or, or even cutting, which isn't going to happen, or raising um, the EU budget, um, it is going to be a very, very difficult conversation because apart from anything else, what we forget in this country is that uh, tempers are really getting quite short uh, in Berlin and indeed in Paris. Um, and we are going to be cut perhaps less slack than we thought we were. Meanwhile, in this country, uh, we see the opinion polls um, becoming steadily, really quite dramatically, uh, more Eurosceptic, not just on the surface, but deep down. And so I think David Cameron's uh, agonizing problem is going to be squaring these circles. We thought that this was a problem that was going to be postponed for quite a long time, possibly until after the next general election. Um, but I think looking at what's happened uh, inside the Eurozone during the position of crisis, it's harder and harder to see how that's going to be possible. Um, the only obvious solution uh, to the, the agonies of the Eurozone, as seen from uh, Angela Merkel's office and from Constance Holland's office, of course, as well, is going to involve uh, deepening. We all understand that. Um, it's going to involve the creation of a fully effective single economy with a single taxation system and, above all, a single pot of money <laughs> at the centre. And it is very, very hard to see what alternative to that um, there is for the Eurozone countries at the moment. And at the same time, it is really hard to see how this country, given the, the public opinion position, is going to be able to swallow that. Now, that's why I say it's existential. Um, we used to talk, when I came into politics, about it was going to be splitting the Tory party. Well, not any longer, because the Tory party is so uh, overwhelmingly Eurosceptic. It might splinter off at the edge with Ken, Cl Ken Clark on the one side and almost everybody else on the other, but it's hardly a kind of visceral split down the middle. Um, so there are going to be some really, really serious questions. Um, uh, David Davis's um, proposal this morning for a series of demands to go to the British people in a plebiscite um, as the basis for negotiation so that uh, the continent understood that there was the real threat of complete British withdrawal if we didn't get what we wanted is something that will catch fire, I think, on the Conservative backbenches and is going to be very hard uh, for Cameron to um, deal with. Therefore, the deal which says... Yes, we are going to see uh, higher taxes um, for people at the top in America and probably higher taxes than there would have been had the Republicans done a deal before the presidential election in return for um, some quite tough spending cuts uh, in welfare uh, and all sorts of other areas that the Obama administration will offer up. That kind of deal is beginning to um, become plausible and talked about in Washington right at the moment. And interestingly, of course, 
it's not so different from the deal that's being negotiated inside our coalition here, is it? Um, where we have uh, old Vince and friends um, uh, pressing very, very hard for a new wealth tax of some kind. We read today it's not going to be uh, based on council tax bans, which is narrowing all the time the, the range of possibilities, which makes it more likely, I suppose, that it's going to be some kind of stamp duty or whatever, in return for um, a new series of freezes on welfare. It's the same politics in both countries, which is that if you talk to people, they do understand that we are hugely, grotesquely overborrowed uh, and have a really, really serious problem to get rid of. And rather reassuringly, electorates in both countries seem to be able to put up with this. Um, we haven't seen a great deal of rioting on the streets in America or in Britain. But what clearly people want in return is to feel that people are paying their own, paying their, their whack. Um, people at the top are paying their whack, and in return, they will put up with some freezes um, towards uh, welfare spending and other traditional government programs. The same kind of negotiation in our very different systems. The Americans have a coalition between the presidency and Congress, and we've got a coalition between the Liberal Democrats and the Conservatives. Different coalitions, but coming to the same sort of um, decisions. Um, uh, both of them, of course, having to do this um, with the entirely supportive and enthusiastic um, help of the media uh, in both countries. Um, it was once, it, 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 it was, I, I thought it was once well put. I was a, a, a newspaper columnist for a long time, and I remember wincing when I read somebody saying that uh, the job of a newspaper columnist um, in a modern democracy is to accept that political fighting is basically a series of wars and battles, and to wait until the battle is over and then come down and bayonet the wounded. Um, <laughs> that's, that's, that's my second uh, favorite um, motto. My, my, my first one, and, and we have uh, another newspaper editor sitting on the front table there. Um, my first one um, is from um, the great uh, mordant wit uh, and American journalist H.L. Uh, Mencken, um, who said that the really crucial thing as a newspaper editor, uh, your job was to separate the wheat from the chaff and then print the chaff. Um, and, and, and there's a lot in that. Um, m many of us spend a lot of time doing that. Um, so, 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 so those are some of the, the enormous problems facing. I, I wanted, before I finish, however, to, to point out some of the things that are actually going rather well. This may seem odd, coming from somebody employed by the BBC. Um, <laughs> but wait, wait. There is method in my madness. It does seem to me that we have a sort of strange, unacknowledged, real constitution in this country, which says that every major institution glides along rather smugly uh, for a period of time and then is suddenly hit by the most appalling uh, S storm, um, total chaos, total meltdown, uh, appears to be on the edge of collapse, um, huge amounts of public vitriol and ridicule. And then something else happens. And that's the case, I would, have, I would suggest to you, uh, with the royal family, uh, back, in the day, well, back to the days of the death of Diana and all of that. I remember as a newspaper journalist that period very, very vividly. I was editing a newspaper at the time, and it was an extraordinary period when the entire country completely lost its marbles. Um, uh, and I can remember um, people coming back in floods of tears in the center of London looking. We all went Neapolitan, you know? We had great kind of public shrines and, and, and we all went a bit touchy-feely and it was very, very un-British. And the monarchy appeared to be wobbling a bit. Um, I can remember going to, to, to Princess Diana's funeral and I was standing in the queue outside Westminster Abbey and in front of me um, there were two uh, members, I think, of the, I'm, I'm not very good on the military, but I think it was probably the lifeguards um, in large leather boots um, with chains and straps and, you know, swords and scabbards and so on. And behind me, there were two other chaps with large leather boots and chains and scabbards and so on, holding hands. And I thought, <laughs> I thought, this has never happened in the, in, in, in the history of Britain before. Um, and it probably will never happen again. It was a very strange time, but what happened to the royal family? Actually, they were able to learn some lessons and regroup and have never been in a stronger position, I would suggest, than they are now. Um, the same thing has happened to the city. The same thing certainly has happened to the House of Commons, where 
Uh, only two years ago, it looked like uh, the reputation of MPs couldn't possibly be lower. People were being screamed at and shouted at in the streets. Um, they were all being treated like, uh, th th they thought, like thieves. Um, uh, and some of them had been, of course. Uh, there, there was that. Um, but, but actually, what's happened, I would suggest, uh, it may be unfashionable to say so, the House of Commons has rarely been in stronger shape than it is today uh, in terms of the, the way select committees work, in terms of the intelligence and the sharpness and the cutting edge of some of those young people who've come into politics. Uh, in a, I think the House of Commons is in a fantastic shape at the moment, actually. Um, the same thing is going to happen, um, I would suggest, to the city um, as it goes through this rough, rough period, depending on what uh, legislation the government comes up with in the end. Again and again, you see institutions um, which appear to be taken to pieces and battered, um, then learning the lessons, regathering, um, and uh, coming forward again. And I think it will happen to my institution too. And by the way, making absolutely no um, political point at all, because I have no political views, um, never have, well, I have had, but um, as I've said before, um, when you join the BBC, uh, you have to present yourself to the Director General of the day, uh, who was a pair of secretaries um, down in the basement in the house, uh, in, in Broadcasting House. And he then says, can I see your organs of opinion, please? And then he removes them with the secretaries, pops them into a jar of formaldehyde, on goes the top, and he said, I'll give them back to you when you leave. <laughs> Which was sort of an okay deal uh, until we saw Nadine Doris in, uh, in the jungle. I have a nasty feeling that they're being fed to her. Um, um, very, very worrying thought indeed. Um, at any rate, um, I do think um, what we have to understand when different institutions go through these moments of crisis, actually, partly because of a raucous and aggressive free press, uh, which can be extremely painful, and I, I know, um, <laughs> extremely painful and stinging at times, um, and the vigor of our national debate, mostly our institutions do learn um, and do move forward again. Um, and that is how the system in this country actually works. Um, so I end up um, pretty optimistic. Um, I think the coalition is going to go through a very, very rough time um, as the European de get debate gets ever more heated. I don't see how we're going to get through the next few years in this country without some kind of referendum. And I think at the moment, the way the, the, the public opinion is positioned, uh, old Ed Miliband with Gromit at his side has a, has a tough job there. Um, but I, you know, I do think that our institutions are in surprisingly strong form. Every single time I come across a big national issue and I'm thinking about it and I'm wondering what to ask politicians on Sunday morning, um, the first thing in my mind is what is the mood of the public? What is public opinion looking like? What is the polling says? That says something. We still have a very, very vigorous democracy. We need a slightly more vigorous economy. Um, that's your job not mine, um, but thank you for being so attentive, and uh, I can say the one really, really popular thing uh, of the evening, which is that it's time for pudding. Thank you. Yeah.